Hello everyone, I'm Enrico Lukinat from the University of Bologna and the Magnetic Resonance Center in Florence. In the first part of this video, I will introduce the basics of Incel NMR spectroscopy. What is Incel NMR? Incel NMR is a unique application of uh, uh, biomolecular NMR that allows you to uh, observe directly macromolecules such as proteins or nucleic acids inside the uh, living cells, which can be either bacteria or eukaryotic, even uh, human cells, like you will see in this tutorial. Um, as such, it is a unique approach that allows you to obtain uh, uh, biologically relevant information at the atomic level on the system uh, uh, under investigation. And it combines this uh, high resolution of NMR to the high um, uh, biological significance of the data that you obtain. In this way, by comparison between the in-cell NMR data and the data that you normally obtain in vitro, it can be uh, employed as a powerful tool to validate the uh, significance of the information that you obtain in vitro by comparison uh, in cell versus in vitro. So, for example, it can be applied to monitor uh, protein uh, folding and maturation processes, for example, uh, involving uh, metal binding and disulfide bond uh, formation, or it can be applied to uh, investigate the conformation of intrinsically unfolded proteins in the cells, and can also be used to uh, investigate differences in the three-dimensional structure of proteins, which are due to the effect to the interaction between your protein and the intracellular environment. So what is the effect of the cellular environment? Indeed, the intracellular environment can have many effects on the behavior of the, of the protein of interest. Uh, among these, the molecular crowding is uh, one of the clearly one major factor inducing potentially inducing changes in your proteins. And that is because uh, the inside of the cell, the cytosol, for example, it's a very dense and crowded solution of macromolecules. It's estimated that it can contain more than 300 grams per liter of macromolecules, of proteins, which is a lot. And on top of that, they also have uh, nucleic acids, such as uh, mainly messenger RNA that can reach up to 30 grams per liter. All these has, um, can have a huge effect on your protein, uh, which is also dependent uh, on the chemical properties of the, on the surface of your protein, so it can be protein dependent. Um, the main effect of macromolecular crowding is the excluded volume that has an effect, a thermodynamic uh, effect on the stability of the folding of your proteins. But then there are also uh, protein dependent effects such as uh, interactions occurring between components of the cellular milieu and uh, the surface of your protein. So these are clearly very protein specific and uh, can have uh, profound uh, effects on the NMR spectra. Let's see how. So uh, first of all, um, Intel NMR is a structural biology, has still a structural biology technique. You're observing the protein and not the cell. And as such, it, re it relies on two-dimensional or more or high dimensionality NMR experiments uh, which often make use of isotope labeling. So in such a way that you can uh, acquire experiments uh, uh, like HSQC or HMQC or even uh, triple resonance experiments. Now these experiments require isotopic labeling so I will show you that we also do isotopic labeling. This has two uh, reasons. One is the classical uh, one that you you need to enrich your protein in the isotopes which would be very have a very low abundance uh, in natural abundance like uh, carbon 13 and nitrogen 15. The second reason is that it gives you contrast in the sense that you can exploit the labeling to only observe the protein of interest and not all the other cellular components. So this isotopic labeling normally most commonly use this N15, nitrogen 15 labeling. However, also carbon 13 can be very useful. I will show you later a few examples. So uh, N15 labeling is actually preferred uh, with respect to um, versus uh, carbon 13 labeling because the um, uh, natural abundance of carbon 13 is still 1% 
higher than is 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 uh, higher than the natural abundance of nitrogen 15, and there are many more molecules, uh, carbon atoms contained in biological molecules, which means that uh, uh, put together, if you put all carbon 13 together, you will have many more. Uh, much more signal from uh, the natural abundance of carbon-13 from the cells themselves. And this will lead you to background signals, even if you don't label your protein, arising from the metabolites of the cells. Uh, in comparison, F15 will give you a much cleaner spectrum, because cellular metabolites contain very much fewer NH amide groups, which are the ones that you will observe on proteins. Uh, alternative, then, then you, if, you, if you record the triple resonance experiments, then these can exploit the N15 as a filter to clean also the signals that you will detect from the carbon-13 from your protein backbone. So what are the effects on the NMR spectra? So first, you can have some non-specific effect that usually affect all of your, all any protein of interest that you can observe. Um, these are mainly due to the differences. I mean, this, uh, you, you could have small chemical shift differences between uh, the cellular environment and the pure solution, which are caused by crowding itself or weak interactions between your protein and, the, and, and other cellular components. And this, um, uh, and then you can have different composition, like different pH. All these type of effect can actually be accounted for. You could reproduce an in vitro buffer uh, with the same uh, properties of the cytosol, and then you should match more or less these two uh, environments. Uh, then you have an increase in viscosity that you can also replicate in vitro. All these will, uh, this slight uh, increase in viscosity will cause um, a slowdown of the reorientation of your molecule, that is the tumbling rate. So as the tumbling rate goes down, the NMR line shape gets broader. So you get line broadening due to this uh, slowdown of the, of the rotation of your protein in solution, of the tumbling rate of your protein in solution. Now this effect can be much more pronounced for some proteins, and that is very protein dependent effect. If uh, your protein undergoes uh, multiple weak interaction or uh, even strong interaction with selective uh, components like protein partners that uh, uh, has the, have the consequence of decreasing the tumbling rate of your protein so much, for example, by uh, forming a stable complex of a high molecular weight, or if your protein interacts with the cell membrane or with some cytoskeletal components uh, or DNA, chromatin, anything very large, it will cause your protein to tumble so slow or even not tumble at all that that will cause a relaxation and broadening of your line of your uh, protein signals uh, beyond detection. That means that it will cancel completely your signal. Now, this can happen even for, for small soluble proteins. And in itself, this kind of uh, effect is interesting. However, it, uh, it is a limitation in, in the sense that you then you cannot study your protein anymore. However, in the case when, when you can still detect protein signals, then the most important probe, uh, the most important type of information that you can obtain by cell NMR is chemical shift perturbation. So you, as you may know, chemical shift is extremely sensitive to any changes in the chemical environment of the nucleus. So it means that for each nucleus that you can observe, chemical shift changes between in cell and in vitro will give you, will report you directly on any changes like conformational changes or chemical changes um, occurring in the cellular environment. This is uh, uh, the most powerful uh, approach for using in cell NMR to analyze proteins. You can detect from mapping chemical shift changes on your protein, you can understand whether there is a conformational change or whether there is interactions occurring on specific parts of your protein.